Welcome everybody to the PID webinar. Or should I say this is a joint PID PPAF webinar. My name is Nadeem al -Haq, welcoming you to the PID PPAF joint webinar, Unpacking Poverty and Poverty Graduation. Well, that's a wonderful theme. I'm happy and would love to learn more about this. Uh, PPAF, as you all know, is a poverty alleviation fund, which has been there for a number of years and done some very good work. And uh, I hope Kazi Azmatisa is here. Uh, we should welcome him too. He's the head of PPAF and uh, PAD is an old think tank. And uh, so it's good to see this collaboration. We are all um, always seeking collaboration. We always want collaboration. I think the research community can only grow with collaboration, otherwise it can't. So this collaboration is most welcome and most, um, you know, uh, happy. So let's begin the webinar. I will bring in uh, Nasser, Dr. Nasser Iqbal, the Dean at PAID, and uh, uh, himself a poverty researcher, a well-known figure in poverty. Nasser Iqbal engineered this whole thing, so I will ask him to introduce the session to you and to moderate the session. Nasser Sab, go ahead. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, Really, this is a very innovative webinar creating a, based on whatever we have already done and the, and the learning from the experience of PPF and, and especially from the international community. So I'll just start with the, 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 the key notion that our founder father said that we have to create a happy and contented people, a contented society. So yet after seven decades, our planner failed to create a happy society due to these multi-dimensional deprivations ranging from monetary poverty to social poverty and institutional poverty. And if we look into the, the real number, more than 50 million people face income poverty, especially they are, uh, they are very like shock sensitive to due to their livelihood strategies linked with the, the insecure livelihood patterns. Similarly, around 75 million people are facing social poverty in terms of education and health, and around 50 million people also face environmental poverty. This brings us to the question for this, the whole discussion that we are hoping today with our expert that how we can break this vicious circle of poverty and create a happy society where everyone can feel that we have enough resources to, to live a decent life. So, uh, uh, in the previous, we have invited Professor Ben and Professor Benerji to give a very lively discussion on how we can learn from the international experiences and building on the breaking out of poverty trap webinar that with the, the, the Nobel laureate uh, Abhijit Benerji. This webinar basically look into closely how the poverty graduation program basically work in globally and especially in Pakistan. More specifically, the, the webinar aims to unpack what define life poverty and how current poverty graduation model like National Poverty Graduation Program run by the, the PPF and also the, the very famous example of the BRAC model that is also on the same foot. So in this uh, the, uh, webinar, we are also aiming to see the key issues that uh, the, our presenter basically We'll dig into these issues, uh, how we can ensure the key challenges, those are attached with the, the graduation model. And to me, they, there are two or three key issues. One is the scalability of these models. If we do experiment at a very small scale and we fail to, to expand it at a very large scale, then what would be the, the efficacy of these models? Then effectiveness and last, the sustainability of the these efforts that these graduation model put in to, to, to break this vicious circle of poverty. Because if we look into the research example of this uh, pandemic, there is a massive uh, like evidence that the, there is exponential increase in poverty and our evidence from five various studies also show that the poverty will in, is increased from 45 million to around 60 million. With this background, we have a very learned uh, uh, the panelists for this webinar. Uh, we, uh, today we have uh, three panelists, uh, Dr. Shujat, uh, the, the labor economist, currently is working with 
fight and previously he was heading mne wing of the one of the largest social protection program in pakistan namely the benzir income support program he has a vast experience in uh, looking into the poverty and poverty dynamics uh, the other is we uh, we are uh, like uh, we have professor imran rasool with us uh, he is one of the distinguished professor working at university college london he is co director of esrc center of for microeconomic analysis of public policy at institute for fiscal studies and he has a vast experience in term of conducting research not only uh, globally but in pakistan he currently he is working with, with P, uh, ppf to to experiment in new models to innovate in this graduation strategy and the third panelist we have ms samal akatali khan uh, she has worked in the field of human rights and development for the last 20 years with experience in pakistan and overseas she has successfully led regional and global development teams and program which incorporated right based approach to poverty reduction so with this uh, i'll uh, invite dr shuja to give a brief introduction what are the economic opportunities that we see are available for the poor that we can uh, use different uh, graduation program to, to reap those the benefits so over to dr shuja thank you dr nasser uh, am i audible and i think uh, my presentation will also be uh, shareable yes, yes sir please yeah yeah so uh, <coughs> respected colleagues uh, assalam alaikum and good evening uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to focus on uh, reviewing the uh, poverty graduation models and uh, as dr nasser have mentioned that we have two distinguished uh, speakers uh, ms samia liaquat and dr sool uh, that have wide uh, practical experience uh, because ms samia is associated with ppf and ppf have more than two decades experience on poverty alleviation so i will attempt uh, uh, to initiate a discussion that uh, where we are standing at the present and what we should do to modify the poverty alleviation programs Uh, so that they can bring a real change uh, in the life of poor and marginalized segments uh, so so these changes should be um, sustainable uh, so uh, i will raise uh, uh, certain questions uh, that may help our distinguished speakers uh, to enrich uh, the ideas that how we can modify our poverty alleviation programs and since i worked at bisp uh, for more than 5 years uh, so i will talk on certain issues that right now our social protection programs are facing uh, in terms of sustainability as uh, well as scalability so firstly uh, why we required the poverty uh, eradication programs uh, because you know that right now almost all the low income countries they are replicating uh, poverty eradication programs and there are social protection interventions so there are four major reasons that's why we required the poverty uh, poverty models Uh, the first is a uh, uh, redistributive uh, purpose to uplift the poor and marginalized segments because resources are not uh, even even distributed in the uh, low income countries uh, so there is poverty and there is inequality so uh, objective of all these uh, social protection and poverty graduation models is to promote resilience equity and opportunity among the poor households second uh, the major challenge is that right now in low income countries including in pakistan uh, we lack competitive markets so these markets have certain distortion and that's why they are disproportionately affecting the poor and marginalized segments and second we lack we don't have insurance programs like in developed countries uh, they have universal health coverage they have insurance so right now we don't have so that's why uh, these uh, distortions in the markets they motivate to initiate certain social poverty eradication interventions and third uh, you know that in low income countries including in pakistan we have lot of shocks um, like health shocks like um, food inflation uh, so so that's why they uh, 
basically hamper the poor peoples to accumulate their uh, soft as well as physical assets. So aim of these programs is that let's build the uh, asset accumulation. And fourth uh, major uh, uh, promotion is that uh, uh, let's change the behavioral and uh, household bargaining powers. Like in Pakistan, we have uh, uh, quite limited women labor force participation. We have certain women empowerment issues like education, access to financial inclusion. So that's why BISP started uh, uh, to give cash and all BISP interventions have a major focus on women. So these are the uh, main four reasons. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Nasser have mentioned that poverty, the measurement of poverty is itself a debatable in Pakistan. We have various forms of poverty. Uh, and our official methodology to measure poverty is consumption based. Uh, but uh, the challenge is that uh, there is a mixed nexus between growth and poverty in Pakistan, where in some periods, uh, even we are facing uh, a declining poverty, even in low income growth period. For example, if you look at the 2007 and 2010 period, there was sluggish growth, there was high inflation, uh, there was worse law and order situation, but poverty significantly declined. And same uh, in 2008 episode, when we have uh, just growth below 2% even, still poverty is declining. So, uh, so still, uh, it is uh, a debatable that how we uh, define the poverty. So uh, uh, before explaining this uh, poverty graduation strategy, uh, I want to highlight uh, uh, that the empirical evidences suggest that poverty cannot be alleviated only through micro interventions like cash transfers or microfinance. So uh, uh, most of literature in Pakistan, uh, it mostly focus on government initiatives like social safety nets, microfinance, employment, et cetera. But this debate mostly ignore uh, the most enduring way out of poverty, that is self-help, as uh, Dr. Banerjee uh, said uh, two weeks uh, earlier. So dependency of the poor on any form of assistance can lead to their social as well as economic exclusion. Uh, but the self-help to happen, there must be an opportunity. And Pied hold a, a series of webinars on street vendors, urbanizations, that how uh, opportunity can be created for the uh, poor. So uh, our poverty graduation strategy uh, should have three pillars. First uh, is the sustained growth, the sustained growth that create productive jobs and economic opportunities. Uh, second is investment on social inclusion uh, to ensure equal access to economic opportunities. So we have to invest on education, we have to invest on health, and other productive services that can build human capabilities and create opportunity for the poor. And third could be the social safety net that to protect the chronically poor and uh, offset the uh, adverse impacts of shocks. But uh, right now, uh, in Pakistan, we are relying a lot on social protection initiatives as well as microfinance initiatives as a tool for poverty elevation without giving much weight to macroeconomic policies like sustained growth, uh, social inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Rasool may correct me uh, that Bangladesh growth is propelled by conductive macroeconomic policies where the government invested heavily uh, on expanding and improving economic infrastructure and human capital. And it has developed the industry as the backbone of the economy. And then microfinance has supplementary contributed to mitigating poverty. So alone, uh, social safety nets or social protection programs might not be sufficient uh, to alleviate poverty. So uh, uh, here we are facing that right now. We don't have a sustained growth. Uh, you know that we are in a demographic transition phase where we require 7 to 8 percent growth. Uh, to uh, absorb this uh, influx of youth, but we don't have the growth that can create uh, job opportunities. Similarly, we are facing certain challenges uh, on social inclusion. Uh, you can see on this slide uh, that uh, we have severe dropout rates. Look at Balochistan, where uh, net enrollment rate at the primary is just 35% for women, female and it is just 17% at middle and uh, only 9% at metric. So we uh, uh, have certain areas 
that would have uh, uh, pockets of poverty and who don't have education, who don't have certain capabilities and opportunities that can uh, create uh, opportunities for the poor. And then we have a very uh, big transition from education to employment. For example, in uh, this slide, you can see that uh, like uh, uh, I have explored it from uh, the labor force survey that uh, only 7% of the uh, young women, they have completed education. And uh, less than half, they have transited it to labor market. Only 47% of, of them, they have transited to labor market. And 49% uh, of those who have transited to labor market, 49% are unemployed. So that's why uh, our education, on one side, we have a big quantity of education, but on the other side, we have a big quality as well as certain labor market issues that we don't have decent. Business. So these are the challenges which we are facing. Now we have the third pillar on which I will focus, uh, uh, especially in terms of um, uh, scalability. Uh, and sustainability uh, that before 2000s we have need based interventions and still we are running these need based interventions like zakat like battle mark uh, in 90s uh, we started social action programs uh, but again spending on these programs was compromised so formally we started social protection programs in uh, early 2000 like you can see poverty reduction strategy paper in 2001 and then we have microfinancing uh, initiatives like ppf was emerged in uh, 2001 and then uh, there was a strategy uh, national social protection strategy that was emerged in 2007 and this was emerged in 2008 and recently the government has uh, established the uh, uh, a well comprehensive ISAS strategy that was implemented in 2019. Uh, uh, and similarly, we have certain provincial uh, social protection programs like Punjab have established the Punjab Social Protection Authority. Um, similarly, KP government is uh, implementing in South Guard. Uh, and so other provinces also have some sort of social protection programs. So, so, uh, uh, good, uh, so right now we are focusing and we are trying to uh, uh, resolve our education and livelihood challenges through the social protection programs that alone might not be helpful. For example, this is the ISA strategy uh, that is trying that through social protection programs, we will improve human capital development, we will improve livelihood and jobs, and we will improve governance, etc. So it might not be sufficient. So, uh, uh, on this slide, uh, uh, we have certain scalability and sustainability challenges. For example, in this slide, you can see that uh, uh, BISP has invested a lot of amount uh, on unconditional cash transfers. So, so there is one stagnation that BISP was merged in 2008, but still we are relying on unconditional cash transfers. We have less innovation. Uh, we have limited capacity to improve programs. So that's why uh, still you can see that uh, after nine, 10 years intervention, still a lot of people, for example, uh, you can see this slide that 88% of the BASP beneficiaries, they were poor in 2011. And 73% uh, of the beneficiaries are still poor in 2009. So it means that, uh, uh, despite of spending a lot of amount, more than 700 billion rupees, uh, uh, this has not succeeded to reduce poverty. So, so it, is, it could be one challenge that uh, we lack a, a, a certain group of uh, uh, programs uh, mixed with unconditional as well as conditional cash transfers that can uh, graduate the people out of poverty on sustainable basis. Second, uh, we also have, uh, so right now, uh, I think that uh, financing on social protection is not a big issue in Pakistan. When this was started, uh, the budget was just 34 billion. And uh, when People's Party left, it was 70 billion. And when PMLN left in 2018, it was 125 billion. And right now, it is more than 200 billion. So right now, the challenge is that how uh, we can scalable these programs and we can sustainable these programs so that they can promote equity, uh, resilience and opportunity for the program. So right now we have certain issues. I will highlight 
uh, these issues through this uh, by this slide. So first, uh, we have mostly the donor-driven interventions uh, with limited indigenous capacity to design the programs. Uh, in BISP uh, program, donors have around seven eight percent financial contribution, but mostly these donors quote the examples of Latin American countries like Chile, uh, Mexico, Brazil, where the social protection initiatives have significantly contributed in poverty alleviation. But the real problem is that our regulatory environment and institutional framework is entirely different to these countries. So, uh, for example, in Chile, they have 100% compulsory health insurance. We don't have a health, health insurance. So that's why uh, this is the first challenge that uh, we are highly dependent on donors that how uh, to design the interventions with very limited indigenous capacity to develop initiatives according to our needs and circumstances. Uh, uh, for example, we have the poverty scorecard survey. This is the data that have been extensively used by all the social protection programs of the country. But uh, in 2009-10, uh, BISP conducted this poverty you scorecard. Have in a minute because we have yeah. second, uh, second is uh, uh, the targeting issue. Uh, that we don't have the reliable data of targeting. We have a yeah. static registry. Uh, this registry was updated in 2010-11, and still most of the programs are using this data. Uh, second, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that all the social protection programs they are using this data, but since uh, this yeah. data is not updated, you can so that's why grievance is a major concern. Uh, Another issue in the targeting is that which group for which sort of interventions. As I have mentioned earlier that we might require a combination of UCT and CCT interventions. But right now uh, we are offering micro uh, finance programs even to those people who are ultra poor mm -hmm. and also those who are quasi poor having score of 40, et cetera, et cetera. Another issue is the coordination. Uh, like yeah. uh, for, Can you conclude in a because we have Time for Imran yeah, yeah, I will conclude in a minute. In so, a minute. so another issue is the coordination. For example, I can give you one example yeah. uh, that right now our social protection authorities they are working uh, in a silo mode uh, without contacting with public uh, sector implementing our arms. For example, we have the uh, Sehat Sahular program. Right now, it is a good health insurance program. I can give you the example that, uh, for example, in AJK. Hundred uh, percent of the household they have health insurance, but this health insurance card cannot be used in government hospitals. So, so uh, it means that uh, the government hospitals will be useless because hundred percent population they are encouraging that they will go in private hospitals. Uh, similarly, uh, we have uh, most of our interventions where the federal government is making interventions. We don't have the involvement of provincial governments. So that is another coordination issue. And the major challenge is that uh, for the service delivery, we have, we have absence of local government uh, that can be used uh, to uh, implement the social protection programs in Pakistan. So uh, I would uh, request our honorable speakers that uh, uh, let's have a discussion that whether too much relying on social protection initiatives for poverty elevation without limited weight to the macroeconomic policies would be fruitful or not. And second, whether our ongoing poverty elevation initiatives, particularly the social protection programs, um, how we can make them uh, helpful that they can promote equity, resilience, and opportunity. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Shijat, for giving a very elaborate a presentation on the, the graduation framework and the, uh, uh, the policies at the BISP. Now, without any further delay, I will request Professor Imran Sul to, to explain how we can basically break this uh, poverty circle and try to create a happy and contented society. Thank you, Professor Imran, for giving us a valuable time. Thank you, thank you, Nasser. Thank you uh, for, to the organizers for inviting me here today. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to present um, some results of a, of a collaboration I've been engaged in uh, with, with PPF uh, for almost the best part of a, of a decade now. So let me just talk through 
um, some of the findings that we have comparing alternative models um, to promote the graduation of the ultra poor out, out of poverty. And I'll touch upon some of the issues that Shujat also discussed um, on his slides when, when going through this. So the design of social protection programs we know is sort of a key issue for, for many countries, not just in Pakistan, but many of the other contexts that Shujat also described. And um, Abhijit Banerjee and, and, and sort of co-authors of, of myself have contributed to suggest that um, providing asset transfers to the ultra poor may lead to very high returns to those individuals. And in a long-standing evaluation we've been conducting in, in Bangladesh, we're finding that the provision of asset transfers to the ultra poor in those households allowed them to permanently move out of poverty as measured seven to 10 years uh, later. In fact, in some of our latest work in Bangladesh, we've gone back and started to interview the children of uh, the original recipients to try to measure some of the intergenerational impacts of asset transfers and document improved outcomes for children in terms of education and their subsequent labor market choices. But in this um, evaluation that we've been conducting it with PPF, we wanted to compare and contrast those types of large scale asset transfer programs uh, to the provision of large scale unconditional cash transfer programs. And so there's a growing evidence base to suggest that just the provision of cash may be as effective as trying to provide transfers in kind. And so what we want to do in this study, and I'll present the evidence on this now, is to compare household responses to the receipt of those in-kind asset transfers versus what happens to the ultra poor households if, if, if they obtain equivalent valued but unconditional cash transfers as, um, from, from a policy intervention. And ultimately what I want to try to answer in, in this set of slides is, are both policies equally likely to enable the graduation of the ultra poor out of, out of poverty. And we're going to do that on a large scale, tracking close to 20,000 households over a long period of time. We've been tracking these households now for close to seven or eight years. And so the, the, we're going to evaluate these two interventions using the gold standard of a randomized control trial, as you would have in a medical study, where um, a subset of villages will be randomly assigned to receive asset transfers to the ultra poor households in, in those villages. A random subset of villages will have the ultra poor there be provided with an equivalent valued unconditional cash transfer. And then the pure comparison between these two groups and a control group of households who, who receive neither intervention would allow us to scientifically say precisely what was the causal impact of those interventions on a whole range of economic outcomes for these households. And so in our first set of villages where we provide the in-kind transfers, that's essentially providing a bundle of assets and skills to ultra poor households. Those assets are typically in the form of livestock, although we do also offer them some small scale retail um, assets as well, if, if they choose. And for each type of asset that's provided, there's a complementary set of skills training that's also provided to that household. So it's a combination of both physical and, and human capital that's being provided in those in-kind asset transfers. The value of those transfers is close to 62,000 rupees as measured in 2014 prices. So this is not a small transfer. You can think of this as a big push transfer because as Nasir and, and Sujad indicated, when households uh, are, are in poverty, typically they've been there for a long time. And so small adjustments are unlikely to cause them to permanently move away from poverty. We need to start considering these types of big push interventions. So that's our first set of interventions, those kinds of large scale asset and skills transfers to households. In our second group of villages that look identical um, before we intervene, we offer ultra poor households the equivalent valued unconditional cash transfers. So we provide them with essentially 62,000 rupees to say, spend as you wish. You can use this for consumption. You can use this for investment. You can save it. You can choose to do with it or whatever you wish. And obviously as Sajat was suggesting, economic theory would suggest that if we, if we have perfect markets and neoclassical decision-making, then it's always going to be preferable to provide an unconditional cash transfer over an in-kind transfer, because the unconditional cash transfer can always do at least as well as the in-kind transfer. And the extent to which these two interventions lead to different outcomes for the ultra poor 
tells us something about how well markets are functioning in these contexts and also tells us the nature of decision making that might mean households respond differently than if, if they're aided in cash versus if they're aided in kind. And that's, that's sort of the intellectual basis for why we want to compare these two types of uh, social protection program. It helps us to learn about the economic environment these households uh, reside in to help us design future policies more effectively. But from a policy perspective, these are very two reasonable and realistic forms of social protection program that are being discussed and implemented around the world. With unconditional cash transfers, here we're having a direct horse race um, between those two types of intervention. Okay, so just to just to give a little bit more detail about how the interventions work, in all villages, in both treated villages and control villages, we first conduct an entire census of all households. Uh, that census in our current sample covers about a quarter of a million households in the villages that we've been looking at. So this is a, a large scale project on which we can estimate very detailed impacts on, on villages as a whole. We then construct a zero to 100 poverty score for each household based on a whole variety of different um, assets that, that they may, may uh, hold. And eligible households, ultra poor households, are those who have a poverty score of between zero and 18. In the villages in which we're operating, about 30% of households are classified as being ultra poor according to this criteria. So about you know, a, a quarter to a third of the village will be receiving transfers in, in, in this form. And then in order to determine which assets we provide to, uh, to ultra poor households in each village, we first conduct a market assessment to see what might be the most profitable types of assets and training to provide to households. We then offer households in the in-kind um, uh, transfer treatment, essentially a menu of assets and complementary training. And households can choose multiple asset skills bundles from that menu up to a value of 62,000 rupees. In the second group of villages, the T2 villages, Households are faced with the same choice, but there's one more listed option, which is at the end of the menu of assets and skills. They can also, in, or, or rather, they can choose the equivalent valued unconditional cash transfer and then choose to invest that themselves um, as they wish. Our study takes place in, uh, in four districts in, in Punjab. We have about a, over, just over 100 villages in our sample, as I said, corresponding to about a quarter of a million households who are resident in these villages. So what, what do households actually choose? So in the first set of villages, where households were only offered a combination of assets and complementary training, we see about 60% of households choose some form of productive uh, livestock. About another quarter choose some draft animals. Um, less than 10% choose retail and very few households choose assets off the list that were provided related uh, to crop farming. So the vast majority, three quarters of households choose a livestock related um, combination of, of assets that are provided. And then in conjunction with that, there'll be some specific training that's provided to households. The most commonly selected asset bundles are of the following types, you can see it there at the, at the bottom there. In our second group of villages, where households are given the same choice of assets, but in addition, are given the potential to choose the same value of cash, over 96% of households prefer cash over assets. Okay. And they choose that initially, we then go back to them two weeks later and say, now that you've discussed this, are you willing to change your mind? And very few households uh, change their mind. So households prefer, reveal preferred to us that when offered the choice between cash and assets, they would prefer cash over assets. And so these are the two sets of ultra poor households we're now going to be following over time. Those who chose asset transfers in treatment one when offered a menu of assets and those who preferred to take cash over assets when given a choice of both. These households are identical uh, initially. The only difference between them is that one has chosen cash, the other has chosen some combination of asset transfers. And then in the rest of our study, we then follow these households two years later 
four years later, and we're currently trying to look eight years later to understand um, what happened in, in the long term to this. Now, for those households who took the cash, we asked them, what do you plan to use this cash for? More than three quarters of the households who take the cash say that they will invest this in some kind of livestock related business activity. Uh, about 20% of them say that they'll invest it in some kind of non livestock related business activity. So when provided cash directly, households do state the intention to use that for productive investment purposes, typically related to livestock or some other form of business. Households don't say that they want to use the cash for other types of investment, such as education, nor do they say they want to use the cash for um, fixed expenditures, such as rituals or um, purchasing household assets. So in that sense, when we're providing households with cash, they're very much initially stating that they would try to replicate what was happening in the other group of villages where they were only provided assets, that these households are going to use the cash to then um, purchase assets. The question is, do they actually do that or it, do, it, does their behavior deviate from their, their intentions? And so let me show you the overall impacts um, on labor market activities, what the ultra poor are doing, um, impacts on the total earnings that these households have, which will be a very direct relationship between that and graduation out of poverty. And then the final results that I have in the interest of time just relate to consumption, which again will, will give us um, an indication of whether these households are, are graduating away from poverty. So one interesting aspect here is that there's, well, I always want to make a distinction between what men are doing and what women are doing. Both spouses are typically impacted, but not necessarily in the same way from these types of interventions either because they're not both involved uh, to the same extent in livestock related activities, or they both might not have equal say in how um, cash is spent in the, in the other treatment arm. So if we look at men, for example, and on this axis, what I'm showing you are the different types of activities, labor activities that men could be doing. So this is focusing on the extensive margin. And these are the estimated effects of the program in comparison to the control group who received no intervention at all, what were the two-year impacts of the in-kind asset transfer? What were the two-year impacts of the unconditional cash transfer? And then the four-year impacts are highlighted in slightly darker colors. So what you'll see is that across the board on these margins, the two-year impacts and the four-year impacts are quite similar. And they're very similar between the in-kind asset transfer and the unconditional cash transfer. For both types of social protection, we find that men are less likely to be economically inactive. So they're less likely to be unemployed, moving into the labor force. They're reallocating their labor, so they're much less likely to be engaged in casual wage labor, which we know has very low returns and very volatile returns. And they're much more likely to reallocate their time and be more likely to be engaged in livestock rearing. And that's true both two years later, as well as four years later. However, one noticeable difference here is that you'll see that households who receive the in-kind transfers are much more likely to have switched into livestock related activities. Whereas those households who receive the unconditional cash transfers do switch into livestock related activities, but not to the same extent. Okay, there's a slight leakage there that although they had very high intentions to use the cash to purchase livestock, not all of them end up actually doing so. And it's not that they use this for other forms of self-employment. They're just investing this to a slightly lower extent uh, than our households who are given asset transfers that can only be used for that purpose. So that's the story for men. For women, we find a very similar pattern that women, the impact on women's unemployment is more dramatic than for men because women's labor force participation is low to begin with. Women are not engaged in casual wage labor. So the movements into livestock rearing are coming from the fact that they were economically inactive and now are starting to engage in economic activities related to livestock rearing. And the same for men, they're much more likely to do that if they were given social assistance in the form of asset transfers than in the form of an equivalent valued unconditional cash transfer. And there's just a small impact on other forms of self-employment. 
you can also see that the two-year impacts are quite similar to the four-year impacts. We're not seeing much evidence that these types of social protection program tend to fade out over time. They're having large and persistent impacts um, over this time scale. Next margin is in terms of um, it, how much time they spend on these activities. So what we're seeing here is that uh, when we look at the total amount of hours spent working, that rises both for men, that rises by a greater extent for women, uh, and therefore as a whole, household aggregates are, are, are also rising in terms of total labor supply. And again, we're seeing in increases in labor supply being greater if households are given in-kind transfers rather than if they're given cash transfers, especially for men. So if we're thinking of attachment to the labor market and working as being an effective tool to get out of poverty, that's being nudged further forward with the in-kind transfers, especially for men, than the cash transfers. And that, that matches what I showed you in the previous slide, that in-kind asset transfers are much more likely to cause households to reallocate their time towards these productive livestock rearing activities than are cash transfers. What impact does this have on total earnings then? Well, if we look at earnings coming from employment, these are just the percentage changes from in-kind transfers after two years, in-kind transfers after four years, and then from the cash transfers after two and four years, you can see this, there's a slight increase in earnings, um, which is slightly higher from the in-kind transfers than the, asset tra uh, than, the, than the cash transfers, but both of these impacts are being sustained four years out. The magnitude of the change is between 10 and 15% increases in monthly earnings from employment as a result of these types of social protection program being provided. That rapidly leads to a large share of these households moving out of the poverty uh, uh, threshold and therefore graduating out of um, being ultra poor. Okay, the last result I'm gonna show you is just Rather than looking at employment earnings, I'm going to see how much of this translates into increased consumption. You might think these households are residing in ultra, as ultra poor to begin with, so they have very low levels of, of consumption. We're seeing increases in consumption, both in terms of food consumption and non-food consumption. The majority of consumption for these households is related to food consumption. And so you're seeing increases in food consumption of around about 8% after four years of the of the program. So that has direct impacts on nutrition, well-being, and health of individuals in those households. But one thing I did want to emphasize is that the percentage increase in consumption is 8%. The percentage increase in earnings is closer to 12 or 15%. And that tells us, and we show this in, in the study, that some of the additional earnings are used for consumption, but some of them are also used for savings and investment to help these households build a greater set of assets or to invest in household related assets as well. And so what the programs are doing over, over a long period of time is allowing households to graduate out of poverty, both by allowing them to work to a greater extent, to accumulate earnings, to raise consumption, but also to use some of their earnings to reinvest into new forms of investment and to use as additional savings that may well turn out to be highly relevant when we're able to go back into the field and see how these households manage to cope with the current pandemic. Uh, and that may be quite different depending on whether they were initially given assets many years ago or whether they were given um, unconditional cash transfers. So let me just conclude there. And that's a brief overview of, of our findings comparing these two types of social protection program and how they impact graduation out of uh, uh, ultra poverty. Thank you so much, Imran, for giving a very nice presentation. I was just hoping that you will also present some finding on psychological well-being because in the last year I heard your presentation when you are presenting your work at PPF conference. You said you are looking for that part of this thing also. So it's nice to learn. So, so I'll just give floor to Samuel Akat with the two the, the key points that one while interviewing Kazi Isa. CEO PPF, he said the real poverty is not the monetary poverty or the, the asset-based poverty. The real poverty is, is the, the sense of exclusion that people have. 
so they give the example of balochistan so the, the rightly said they, they are basically feel they are excluded and when i was interviewing the the shweb sahab the, the the one of the pioneer of this rspn they believe that this big push basically create a debt trap so we have to be very like the rational when we are say that we have to give a big push to these poor poor people with these two thoughts i invite samya to to present what actually ppf has contributed to alleviate poverty poverty and create a happy society for us thank you over to samya uh, thank you so much dr nasir uh, thank you to pait for uh, hosting this event uh, and for for agreeing to be a joint host to this event and to uh, dr imran for always uh, you know having having had such a sort of long term relationship with us now in terms of the very important research that you do around social protection and graduation uh, and this is the research that has really helped ppf in develop its whole graduation strategy and approach i will just share my screen uh, if i can and i hope everyone can see this so um i just want to talk a bit about ppf and uh, our uh, um, engagement in the whole graduation uh, approach uh, which started off with uh, a pilot that we uh, we did with um, uh, which was part of the global study on graduation so it was using the brac livelihoods approach which was targeting the ultra poor where asset transfers were being provided to households and uh, with cgap and uh, ifar the international fund for agriculture development who supported us through financing this uh, participation in this pilot uh, we uh, uh, we engaged we initiated our uh, sort of first effort uh, in understanding how do households react better uh, when they when they are provided with asset transfers at this time uh, uh, you know we were still in the process of the whole poverty scorecard surveying so bisp had not yet started uh, so these uh, assets were provided to households and the households were identified the poorest households were identified through participatory wealth rankings through you know using uh, from the within the community uh, the community mobilization approach um when uh, the re initial results came out in 2011 12 we had the midterm review come out and and this showed a very good results uh, to us um, in terms of the impact on households on the treatment households that were provided with a with an asset which was equivalent to around uh, 50000 rupees uh, most of these households did select to go for livestock uh, but there were statistically significant increases in consumption income uh and uh, the the overall asset base of these uh, households um and similar to what dr imran has shown you of the later of the next kind of rct that we were engaged in with him where similar results have have been coming uh, to us um the initial uh, uh, pilot was targeting only 2000 households right and we talked about i think dr shajat talked about what about going to scale and this was very much on ppf's mind how do we take a small pilot that is showing very good results and how do we uh, try and now uh, uh, replicate it across different union councils different provinces um, in the country um and we were working currently with the world bank at that time it was a ppf3 project within which there was a livelihoods component and we decided then that why don't we given the success of this uh, pilot why don't we focus on uh, as part of the overall livelihoods approach focus on giving providing assets to uh, ultra poor households during this time we then did uh, or we uh, bis had already begun its operation so they had started off uh, in providing uh, unconditional cash transfers to households uh, we used the poverty scorecard uh, as the tool in which to objectively identify households uh, for uh, with regard to their eligibility uh, bisp's targeting approach was uh, you know the cut off for bisp was 16.17 on the poverty scorecard uh, so any household below that number who had uh, was eligible to receive uh, a social protection um, uh, from bisp uh, 
with us, we had uh, uh, expanded this group a little bit. So we were from, uh, you know, we were engaging with households that uh, uh, ran the, the range of zero to 18 on the poverty scorecard, um, because we felt that these were still households within this bracket uh, uh, were relatively the same, had the same sort of multi-dimensional aspects of poverty that, that uh, we saw in the BISC households. Um, and we uh, we uh, provided 65,000 assets uh, 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 to households across the four provinces. Um, and as part of this project, we had uh, at that time also um, uh, sort of engaged with Dr. Imran Rasool, uh, with um, uh, the, the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan. Uh, and uh, they, you know, we designed uh, the asset versus cash transfer um, RCT, which uh, um, Dr. Imran has just uh, sort of shown you some of the results of. Um, so um, while the World Bank project was going on, uh, we were looking at how um, can we now use this whole approach of graduation? What is, uh, you know, what is the difference between the initial pilot and the way that we were working under the World Bank approach? And there were some differences, right? Right in the, in the PPF, pilot that we did under BRAC, uh, households received a, a kind of a one year um, kind of stipend uh, allocation as part of um, the overall um, support that we were giving the households. They then received the asset um, uh, that they had decided upon uh, and they also received some health benefits so they could use the local BHU. Under the World Bank project, we uh, did not focus so much on BISP. Uh, so, so we were looking at households that were zero to 18 on the scorecard and uh, they could be BISP or they didn't have to be BISP. Uh, uh, so we did not focus on whether they were receiving a stipend and we did not provide any stipend. We just provided the asset and alongside the asset, we provided the asset training. So, so, so it was either business training or asset management training uh, to households. Um, and in 2016, uh, when this project ended, uh, we had the results from uh, uh, Imran as well, the initial uh, sort of two year results um, um, on, on this. Uh, we also had our own um, sort of assessments and evaluations under the, under, uh, that the World Bank had conducted. And these were showing again, uh, a lot of beneficial impacts on households uh, that had uh, received the asset transfers. So this is what prompted PPF to sort of move into a sort of understanding that, okay, graduation um, is different to social protection, right? I think this is one of the key things where we looked at, yes, you have a, a program running, which is, which is BISP, which is targeting 5 million households and providing a cash stipend on a quarterly basis. Um, and as I think uh, uh, Dr. Shajat showed that this uh, stipend does not have the, the effect of graduating households, rather it gives them sort of some allowance to, to, in, you know, to uh, fulfill their consumption uh, requirements, uh, but they continue to remain sort of in the ultra poor and poor categories. Uh, with us, when we were looking at uh, providing assets, uh, we were looking at this as a graduation approach, meaning that households who are provided assets uh, along with another, you know, other sets of interventions uh, can potentially move out of uh, the need for social protection. Uh, and this would be um, having a, a positive effect on also government investment in uh, such kinds of social protection programs. Um, so as we uh, sort of looked at what our research was showing us, what the learnings were from the implementation of the project under PPF3 uh, uh, with the World Bank, we uh, identified that there are certain sets of interventions that we can um, uh, um, provide to households when they are moving up that poverty scorecard number. So for example, if I have given a household that is a BIS beneficiary, um, uh, so under 16 on the scorecard, if we've provided them an asset and the relevant uh, skills training, we believe that they would potentially, uh, their poverty scorecard would rise. It would, could potentially go up to 18 or 20 or so. Um, but alongside that, we realized that that's not so much enough for us, right? If we want to sustainably graduate households, we require, we need to understand what are the kinds of demands households might have um, and how do we, how can we meet this demand as well as what is the kind of ecosystem that we need to create around that household that can enhance uh, their ability to link up 
uh, with with uh, mainstream markets uh, and to really become uh, to to develop the local economies. Uh, and so for this, we um, had put forward a number of um, supporting um, uh, kinds of um, activities uh, for those households that were provided the assets. Uh, within a community, we also believed, we, we saw that there are households who might not be provided uh, an asset, but who are maybe still within the poor category who could potentially link up with households that we have provided assets to, form common interest groups uh, or production centers and uh, engage in uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 sort of be linked up with markets uh, and with specific companies, et cetera, uh, and can actually support the, the growth of the local economy in that sense. In 2015, the government had also come to us and we had, had uh, requested us to take forward a project that they wanted to do a program around providing interest-free loans to the same uh, uh, ultra poor households. Um, we designed this interest-free loan scheme for them simply, uh, you know, mainly because PPF, when PPF started off, uh, microfinance was, was the major uh, focus, uh, you know, for the first, uh, I think 16 years of PPF, microfinance was a major component of all our work. Uh, we built the microfinance sector. Uh, and then in 2016, we spun off uh, the microfinance arm into a separate uh, for-profit uh, company called the Pakistan Microfinance Investment Company uh, that is continuing to uh, sort of provide, uh, uh, you know, microfinance opportunities at a wholesale level through microfinance institutions and uh, banks down to uh, local individuals. Uh, so when this interest-free loan scheme came up, right, we, we, we kind of understood that there is, was a need, there was a demand amongst our households, our ultra poor households for access to finance. Uh, and most of these ultra poor households, when you look at, um, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to, to uh, get financing, it was very limited and it was very much linked to uh, the areas they were working, where they were as Haris or as, uh, uh, you know, as uh, tenant farmers, where they would get loans from um, their um, landlords, or they would get loans from the local uh, sort of um, middlemen who are providing, you know, by the provision of inputs into agri um, as, uh, supplies. Um, and this obviously was, you know, high levels of interest were being charged around this. Uh, so one of the things that we looked at was how do we actually support poor households? They've got an asset there, as uh, Dr. Imran is saying, they're moving out of the daily wage labor into self-employment, uh, potential entrepreneurship. They may and probably will have a need for uh, financing. Uh, we don't believe that we should put the burden of regular microfinance on them yet because we're not sure, uh, you know, with the interest charged by regular microfinance, how, how that would impact on their ability to repay and to really sustainably graduate. So there is a, a need to support such, such households with the provision of um, interest-free loans, as well as with trying to help them to access uh, uh, formal financial services, such as insurance products, uh, you know, so for example, livestock insurance um, uh, or crop insurance, uh, as well as for looking at um, how they can uh, utilize those loans through providing um, relevant uh, financial literacy trainings, et cetera, et cetera. So PPF slowly had developed was developing this graduation approach. And, and um, we, we felt that there were um, areas where once, you know, a household has gone through two or three uh, potential um, uh, uh, sort of interventions for interest-free loans, where they might have reached a point where they require uh, uh, bigger loan sizes that they can then approach regular microfinance and that they, they are then sustainably have graduated uh, for regular microfinance. Um, so this was the kind of base on which we started working with um, uh, donors as well as government to kind of uh, look at how we can take forward our program, uh, uh, the asset transfers and make it uh, a, a long-term sustainable approach uh, uh, for um, uh, ultra poor households. Into 2017, uh, IFAD came back to us and together with them, we designed the National Poverty Graduation Program. Uh, and this was very much uh, built on the learnings of the previous uh, sort of, you know, eight to nine years of having delivered asset transfers and of the research around that. Uh, and I'm just going to, before I move on to 
uh, uh, the rest of the slide, I'm just going to take you to the National Poverty Graduation Program. So, so basically within this, uh, the idea was that approximately we would transfer funds to uh, over 170,000 households in, in the form of assets, um, where we say tangible and intangible assets. By intangible assets, we also believe that vocational skills uh, are uh, very much now uh, something that uh, uh, delivers a good return on the investment and, and proper vocational uh, trainings, uh, which are certificate, you know, where certificates are provided, can take the form of, of a, an asset. So it doesn't need to be a physical asset. Um, alongside that, we wanted to provide interest-free loans to households. Um, and of these uh, asset transfers, 60% uh, of our target group was to be women because we had looked at the BISP, uh, um, uh, the whole uh, BISP approach as well, where, where you know, all the, um, uh, the grants are going towards to women. Uh, and we felt that where uh, uh, this approach will be useful for women is where there is a mentoring as well of the household to ensure that women understand their ownership of the asset, that, that the household is involved in developing its own uh, sort of livelihood investment plan to, under skill, uh, to understand the, the skills and the resources that they currently have and to better understand how that asset can be utilized uh, for their benefit. Um, so when we developed this program, we were, um, uh, you know, this was something where we felt that finally we can now start going to scale. Uh, right, so it was 25 districts, nearly 400 union councils across Pakistan, uh, nearly 200,000 households who we felt could graduate uh, uh, out of BISP. Uh, and this coincided also with the launch of the government's uh, uh, SR strategy, uh, within which there was a national poverty graduation initiative, that this is one of the initiatives under SR. Uh, and under this, there are three areas. Uh, and all of these three areas are being uh, managed by PPF. Uh, one is the asset transfers, that's called Amdan. Uh, the vocational and skills training uh, is also part of Amdan, and then the interest-free loans. And uh, government having seen some of the impacts also of the interest-free loans and the demand coming from communities for more loans has committed uh, a further 5 billion rupees to PPF to expand our interest-free loan um, uh, outreach. Uh, currently we're in 45 districts and we hope to reach uh, you know, 100 districts once this additional financing uh, comes to us uh, across. Um, Finally, I just want to talk to you a bit about the implementation, uh, graduation in action. What is it that we've learned and how is it that under NPGP, we really want to build up on, on this learning. Uh, and so what you see here is just a slide that shows you what are the different elements of uh, our graduation uh, program. Um, and the initial two elements which you see on the left hand side is the targeting and market value chain analysis. So one of the learnings has been that uh, targeting is essential, right? And the correct targeting, ensuring that we are including the poorest households and not leaving out anyone is critical for for the success uh, of this kind of a, a large scale intervention. Uh, and while we have BISP data, available to us. Uh, uh, this data is now, you know, it's now 10, 11 years old. So there have been a lot of changes in the country over the last 10, 11 years. So when we go into uh, any uh, district, into any union council, while we take our uh, uh, lead from uh, using the BISP data, the old BISP data, we, in, we will always go down to the communities. We will engage with the community institutions uh, and this is one thing, mentoring community institutions is one of the, the, the fundamentals that we do wherever, you know, whatever program we are working in. Uh, and we engage with the communities to undertake a participatory wealth ranking where on the basis of what they consider poverty to be, who do they identify as the poorest households? And then we match what the community has identified as the poorest households with the original BISP uh, 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 data of uh, households that, that were uh, uh, zero to 18 on that on the BISP scorecard. Um, and we then undertake a new um, uh, survey uh, for those households that, that are being identified by the community as well as by BISP uh, to ensure that we are uh, including the right set of people. And this is quite interesting because in certain parts of the country, there have been changes, right? So we are finding currently that in, in say certain parts of Sindh, you know, 30, 20 to 30% of households 
that were originally in the BISP data set have now graduated uh, and uh, are now moving out, uh, have moved out of poverty. So they don't require the asset transfers anymore. But there is another maybe, you know, 15 to 20% new households that are being identified that were not there uh, in the original BISP registry, uh, NSER registry. So uh, those households are now being included. So targeting is essential. Uh, and alongside that, right, we need to get households to think about business, uh, to think about what kind of occupations have the best impact on their ability to earn incomes uh, and to, to sustainably earn these incomes. So we have started to do undertake market uh, and value chain assessments uh, in districts to understand what are the best, what could be the best kinds of productive assets uh, for households to uh, require. Um, as part of this, uh, there are households who continue to take the BISP allowance. When we start a project, we, we say that it would take, you know, for us, we've realized that it's probably a two year period for households to graduate out of BISP, during which time having that BISP allowance for them would be, uh, would be relevant. Uh, you know, after, after we do the targeting and the market value chain analysis, uh, you know, that takes the first, you know, three to six months, we then start the asset transfers. Um, and alongside the asset transfers, we are also providing the relevant training and skills development. Um, and one of the things we've also learned, uh, right, is um, how do we really um, support households to, to move out of poverty, right? So one thing is for their incomes to increase by 20% or by 30% and we set targets for ourselves. Another thing is to really understand, okay, what is the current situation we're in? Um, and we have just done a baseline of our NPGP households and we have seen that on average, their monthly earning is 12,000 rupees, um, right? Uh, we also see that in Pakistan, the current poverty line uh, based on the cost of basic needs approach is around 24,000 rupees. Uh, and the national minimum wage has been defined as 17,500 rupees. So when we look at these numbers, we think to ourselves, okay, so for a, for a household that is being provided an asset and is earning approximately 12,000 rupees before they've been provided with an asset, we want them to to be able to move, uh, you know, over two years uh, or over three years uh, to above the poverty line of 24,000 rupees, right? So that would mean a 100% increase in their salary uh, and, and, uh, or in their earnings and in, their, in, uh, in their incomes. So if we are saying that, okay, our assets as they are given to any household uh, uh, gets a 20 to 30% increase in income, how do we actually keep building this up? And uh, this is something with IFAR that we have been working on as, as well as internally within PPF as to the fact that we need to develop businesses. We need to develop business models at the community level. And these could be collective business models, but there has to be a, a focus on not just an asset, which could be livestock, but on actually a collection uh, uh, of households coming together and formalizing themselves into businesses uh, to create uh, uh, local markets and to engage in the, the mainstream and the national markets. Um, so I, I will leave it uh, uh, now as, uh, as of this, I think I'm done for now and I'm out of time uh, and we can go on to questions, thank you. Thank you so much with the one liner, I'll hand over the mic to the vice chancellor to meet the discussion. So uh, over the last two months, I have some experience with NBG beneficiaries. So of course, uh, they, they, they are very much benefited from the, these type of asset transfer and, and the asset transfer to some extent have provides uh, like a cushion to sustain from these type of pandemic. So with this, I'll uh, request Dr. Nadim to please carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Nasir Sab. Thank you, Imran. Thank you. Uh, to everybody, um, Samia and Chuda. <clears throat> I think we've had a great uh, session. A number of good thoughts and ideas have come up. Um, I'll now quickly move to the floor and let people ask questions. Uh, Zia Bande. So just to add a one line, Professor Imran left because he has some urgent meeting with okay. someone. Okay. So we are left with Simon and Shijar. Understood. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Can I put up a question, Dr. Sam? Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, most of this discussion, what I feel uh, is focus on rural poverty. When you're talking about these livestock, it's concerned with the rural po- poverty. I just need to understand that exactly what is the strategy on the urban poverty side for the PPF. And second thing, which I was very intrigued, which you did talk about uh, in the very last Dr. Samia, she did talk about these community linkages, these community institutions, the collective. Now, how that collective is going to work? I mean, to say what sort of a research, because that's what we have seen also when we are talking about uh, uh, these microfinance institutions. Obviously, they have a high cost of funds. So in Pakistan, on average, they are charging 38 to 40 person per annum, the interest rate. So that's quite high, how they are going to sustain themselves. And uh, when you are talking about these development linkages, and you did talk about that the government has said, <clears throat> set aside 5 billion rupees to be distributed into 3.8 million new borrowers. Now, up till now, you have basically, what your figures you are telling us, 282,000 uh, loans have been extended, the interest-free loans. Now, 3.8 million means that you are going to increase it by over 1,000 times. That's a very ambitious target. And when if I divide the 5 billion rupees onto 3.8 million, it comes around 1,315 rupees. So I just want to understand that what are the additional sources you guys are looking into it, where you can generate that much interest-free loans, which are sustainable also. Because in Pakistan, if you look at the total microfinance portfolio, it's about 12 to 13% which are interest-free. The majority is uh, is interest based, so I just need to understand these dynamics that how you guys have planned to work out, and a word on the urban poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Can you please just note these questions? We can uh, take a Gee, few. I have not taken. Karam sir. Yes. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Ji. Ji, I had to ask that. जो ये आप लोगों का जो रिलीफ वर्क जो है ठीक है इसमें पॉलिटिकल जो लाइन जो है उसको किसा सेपरेट कर सकती हैं क्योंकि जो पॉलिटिकल जो मार्जिन है उसको सेपरेट करना इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट ठीक है और जो बेनजीर इनकम सपोर्ट प्रोग्राम जो है ठीक है वो फॉर्म्स वगैरह तो डिस्ट्रीब्यूट हो जाते हैं लेकिन उनकी जो रीइंबर्समेंट्स जो हैं दे आर टोटली पॉलिटिकल ऑन पॉलिटिकल ग्राउंड्स ठीक है सेम गोस टू अदर एरियाज एज़ वेल or for um, like one other like important thing I want to add. For this information, I want to give you. In 2010, I was working as um, the president of Social Welfare Wing of PTI Rawal Pindi. Okay. At that time, we were only a few members of PTI. Okay. And at that time, I I tried we tried our best to distribute this these um, basic this support program forms. But we couldn't get the um, reimbursements. So, how would you like separate this political line? Okay. Hello. Thank you. That's all. That's all I would say. Okay. The next question. Ram Ali, please make. गोराम मैं बात कर रहा हूं बहुत अच्छी प्रेजेंटेशन थी मेरा एक सवाल है कि जो बिस्प के बेनिफिशियरीज हैं अगर वो जा रहे हैं कहीं कैश करवाने सारी तो उनसे 1000 और 500 पे जो है ना पर बेनिफिशियरी लिया जाता है तो क्या ऐसी कोई है हमारे पास जहां हम इसको रोक सकें ताकि उन लोगों को प्रॉपर वे में जो है ना वो चीजें ऑन डोर मिल जाएं और उनको जो है ना वो वहां पे जाके बहुत बड़ी रश में और सारी चीजें खवार ना होना पड़े थैंक यू Thank you so much. So with one my question, I'll hand over to Samia for uh, the answer of the, the, the question. So, so when we are looking into the, the, the best, very comprehensive approach, as you mentioned in the one of the slides that you are adding uh, additional intervention within the package, then the issue is the implementation, how we can uh, like uh, adjust the cost of this whole intervention. Because when I was discussing with 
the Ben and the Rima from MIT about the new approaches looking into the, the graduation. So they, they raised this concern of the hand holding where there is a huge cost involved. Over to Samia. Yeah, thank you. Lots of uh, very difficult questions. So I hope I shall try and do my best. Um, I think in terms of uh, when we look at urban poverty, right? And what is the strategy? You're right. It has to be a very different strategy to the rural poverty strategy. And with PPF, we mainly work in uh, rural development, right? So our strategies are very much focused on rural areas. However, um, there is learning uh, in terms of how one can uh, move forward and uh, for uh, understand to develop a strategy around uh, urban poverty. And one of the big things in Pakistan, right, around urban poverty is the fact that uh, the poverty can be even more entrenched and deeper and more difficult because you do not have those that kind of social support network that you might have in the rural areas. Uh, but in terms of the pluses, the fact is that the, uh, the opportunity for uh, 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 vocational trainings, for linking to jobs and linking to the demand that uh, is there in the market and for technological enhancements to support that uh, vocational training and linkage to jobs, that is very much there in the urban centers and it is not there in the rural areas. Uh, and I think any urban strategy, uh, urban poverty strategy needs to understand because you have a youth bulge, there is a huge kind of youth group within urban centers, uh, this, they have to be addressed. And this has to be addressed through, I feel, the kind of vocational and technical skills training and the linkages with actual employment opportunities or self-employment. So um, I will leave it over there because I'm sure, uh, you know, Dr. Nadeem and, and, and Pied have, have already done uh, many webinars on, on some of these uh, opportunities uh, in urban areas and they can expand more on this topic. Um, in terms of the second uh, question, which was around business collectives, right, and development linkages. So this is something that is definitely new and uh, for us, um, we understand poverty and, and poverty alleviation practices from a development sector perspective, but things need to change. And I think this is really, there is going to be, there has to be a paradigm shift in development. The old ways don't really work much longer. So we need to engage in understanding what is the kind of entrepreneurial business side of this uh, kind of uh, collective that needs to be supported to grow because it is only through the creation of local markets that you are going to be able to have the right kind of opportunities for uh, jobs, for entrepreneurship uh, and for sustainably supporting people to, to live, to earn an income and to move out of poverty. Uh, when we talk about collectives here, we look at currently, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? We are in working in Job in Balochistan and we have we are working with a lot of uh, uh, community villagers uh, who are uh, uh, working, uh, who are growing um, horticulture products like uh, garlic and onions. Now we have done some market research where we realize there is a big demand uh, uh, in, their, in the closer urban centers to them for um, you know, the dried garlic and the dried onions. So, so there is an opportunity to take a product to add value to it, uh, to support them through a system of grants and loans, uh, to support these households to come together to form a business collective, uh, to get the right machinery to be trained on uh, um, uh, doing the drying of the of the garlic and the onions, as well as to support them around branding and packaging, and <clears throat> then link them up to the market so that they can actually develop this business proposition. We are doing a lot of work also with certain of our communities around dairy, right? So the provision of livestock is very much in most asset transfer programs, you find that in the in the rural areas, people require, you know, prefer livestock. And so if you have in a community, if you have, uh, you know, 50 cows or 30 cows or whatever, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the setting up of a dairy cooperative that can, you know, be provided with chillers uh, that can be supported to look at what are the byproducts of dairy, you know, ghee, for example, or butter or uh, other things which, which can be sold, which can be packaged and sold in the local markets as well as in the, in the local urban centers. These are areas that we are really trying to support uh, 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 through providing this kind of value chain um, development development, uh, looking at, you know, doing market assessments, uh, providing um, 
support, business development support to these households, so professional business development support and uh, formalizing their businesses. So getting them registered as businesses uh, and, and uh, guiding and mentoring them in all the aspects of business that will lead to the end product. So. Um, Again, this is something relatively new for PPF that we're doing, but we realize that uh, for us, it's not enough to just uh, now provide an asset and say, okay, we've provided an asset to a household, let's move on. There is a whole, you know, you know, you need socioeconomic development. And that means empowerment as well, empowerment of individuals, empowerment of the family, empowerment of women within those communities. Uh, and given the, the, you know, you've seen the, the education statistics uh, uh, that Dr. Shujat has shown where you're still, you know, way behind in Balochistan, only 9% of girls are, are are moving into high school education or whatever. So, so there is, you know, there is a need for a, a, a socio-economic empowerment uh, at the household level and at the community level, and and this does very much tie into the last question that was asked to me about the issue of implementation and cost, cost effectiveness. And yes, it is more cost effective to hand someone um, five thousand rupees or hundred thousand rupees than it is to have a system in place where you are doing this handholding mentoring and you are consistently engaging with a household over a period of two years to help them sustainably graduate. Um, but this is a cost uh, uh, a question in terms of, um, you know, that government maybe needs to really mull over to understand that if we really want to uh, provide, um, uh, you know, if we want to address multidimensional poverty, and not just income poverty, uh, there is a, a need uh, to use this kind of mentoring approach. Um, and and that, is, that is my personal perspective. And of course, everyone can have their own perspectives. And when we talk about cost effectiveness, right, the idea is that you are moving out of social protection. So instead of having that five, those 5 million households on your roster, you know, continuously year after year after year, and that may be going to 7 million households or 10 million households, the graduation approach means that you invest more, you know, in the, uh, at the beginning uh, with the idea that after year, uh, uh, one or two years, you do not have that household remaining on the registry. Um, and then in the last thing in terms of politicization, so I don't work with BISP, so in terms of, I, and I've heard, yes, that, you know, that there are middlemen who will take 500 rupees or whatever, but I think Dr. Shujat could potentially, uh, you know, respond on that. In terms of politicization, right, one of the things where, we, where you have strong targeting and where you have very objective methodology and means of verification of targeting, you can you can uh, 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 move away from politicization, right? You can actually you can actually prevent politicization because you have criteria, you have objectively verifiable criteria against which households are identified, and that is what allows them to get the asset. Thank you very much. Uh, I will enhance uh, uh, the point that has uh, that has been made by Samia Han. Uh, regarding last two questions on uh, uh, political margins as well as bribes. Uh, I think good thing is that uh, every successive government is owning the BISP. As I have mentioned earlier that every government have uh, allocated more budget. It was started with 18 billion and right now its budget is uh, more than 207 billion. And second thing is that uh, uh, this data uh, that is called poverty scorecard or national socioeconomic registry, uh, this data has been used by every provincial government, irrespective of uh, what is the political affiliation. You know that uh, this data was collected in 2010-11, uh, but Punjab Social Protection Authority used this data. Uh, even KP Insaf uh, card that used the data in last political regime and even your Sehat Sakulat program, et cetera, et cetera. All these programs are using this data. So good thing is that uh, we have a single registry and uh, that has been widely accepted by all the uh, provincial governments, whatever their affiliations. Uh, yes, uh, we have certain targeting issues. Like for example, uh, as I have mentioned earlier that this is a static registry. Uh, it was updated in 2010-11. You know that right now, social uh, Sehat Saulat program is expanding in the country. Recently, 
prime minister have launched in ajk and uh, experta but still we are using this old 2011 data for uh, targeting in 2021 and second uh, uh, i think uh, we have not uh, learned a lot to improve this registry uh, this started to update this registry in 2016 and still bisp is struggling to update this registry so this is more than 5 years that still uh, we are unable to update this registry but previously in 2010 11 uh, this registry was updated just in one year uh, second uh, uh, regarding bribes uh, uh, this is a operational question you know that uh, uh, since i worked with bisp Uh, BISP have made a uh, lot of effort in improving in payment disbursement system. Uh, in 2008, 9, it was uh, Pakistan Post Office. Yes, it was giving payment at the doorsteps, but it was entirely the manual system. Uh, and then this gave the debit card to its beneficiaries. Um, around five million beneficiaries received debit card, but again, this was the challenge that these beneficiaries were quite illiterate. they don't know that how to uh, operate the atm and use this debit card and there was huge replacement rate uh, i think uh, more than 15 lakh card one third card uh, they have been replaced over the last 5 years and recently bis has uh, uh, introduced a new payment system i think uh, right now it is quite innovative uh, payment solution it's totally the cardless payment system uh, this is biometric payments where the beneficiary just required biometric live verification from the nadra database and uh, yes there was bribes because there was middleman because the payments were made on point of sale uh, but recently this has made one good effort that now we have uh, at uh, uh, biometric machines at the atm points so where beneficiaries can go and they can use these atm uh, machines where they can get payment through biometric verification so i think it's quite good that where there is lot of financial inclusion and uh, at at least women herself has to go to receive the payment so 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 it will enhance the financial inclusion okay thank you dr shijar so there is a like question so is there any question from someone assalam alaikum ji if i may be allowed to make a few comments uh, my name is mehwish mahmood i am a university of cambridge graduate and my final year thesis uh, had a component of microfinance in it and i was given a chance to study uh, both the gramin bank model as well as the kashyap foundation model so my question is that uh, merely assuming that a credit mechanism with a high let's say in in our in this case there is no repayment rate but it does have an outreach element to it uh, which has an empowering effect on women borrowers and uh, my research shows that this could be a naive approach for those seeking a larger effective sustainable strategy to poverty alleviation so have we looked into that <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> women empowerment through uh, microfinance um through as far as my research shows um is not really sort of uh, working out for a lot of different countries so is there like a cross country analysis that we are going to keep in mind before we actually start implementing it nationwide thank you very much if you allow let me respond on this um go ahead go ahead uh thank you um uh, avish yeah, yes you're very right um avish i think even in pakistan we see the results of microfinance it's not the silver bullet that it initially you know was was uh, uh, sort of uh, lauded to be um and uh, it has to be used wisely and i think uh, it has to be used uh, keeping in mind uh, what are the um, experiences not only within pakistan but in but elsewhere one of the things that when ppf started its microfinance program we were very clear that the but microfinance was not for the ultra poor right uh, we had seen the effects in india of the mass suicides of farmers etc and in other countries where you know are uh, giving uh, very poor uh, households very poor farmers loans 
uh, with heavy repayment schedules and and uh, uh, heavy interest uh, was was not uh, uh, wasn't resulting in much success and and yes even when it comes directly to women so providing loans to women we've done some research with Ghazala Mansouri of the World Bank on loans and training and and the impact on women and men uh, uh, and the uptake of loans uh, by women and men uh, this was around 2010 11 we found that actually uh, women were not really benefiting from the loans um, right, even though they were the ones taking out the loans. Uh, and so we had to move away from looking at numbers to actually looking at what, what can we do uh, uh, when it comes to supporting uh, uh, women's empowerment? Um, how does this, this work? Is just providing a loan is not enough in itself, right? You require other activities, you require other mentoring for households that actually engages women looks at the kind of work women are doing. So what is the, their labor force participation? What is the kind of activity that they would invest the money in uh, before we sort of you know, engage with them in giving them a loan? Uh, and this has helped us uh, in terms of uh, trying to ensure that, uh, that, that there is empowerment, that, that women's decision-making within the household when it comes to the loan um, is not taken out of their hands, but that they are trying to participate and that they do participate in that decision-making. Um, overall, the idea of interest-free loans, so there is a 95% repayment rate, and there is a question that I missed out in terms of the loan size. The average loan size is around 30,000 rupees, and this is a revolving fund, right? So when we talk about 5 billion rupees or the initial 3.1 billion rupee investment, uh, that means that this money goes in every year it is being revolved once or twice. So, uh, so, you know, right now we have in terms of actual sort of, if we look at the number of lo loans since 2015, I think we have reached up to say uh, around 10 billion ru rupees in terms of when you look at mm -hmm. all of the different uh, revolving loans. So I don't want to belabor the fact, but um, yes, there is definitely room for improvement. Uh, and I, I agree with your points. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else to you? Chalini? One very quick question, you bet. I sign up with the Apna Bob, Samia, sorry, Kapna PP, sorry, PRSP has been doing microfinance and community development for, I guess, over 30 years now. Um, has any evaluation of that been done? Because you're moving into roughly the same territory, aren't you? Uh, when you say uh, PRSP? Yeah. Uh, you mean the Punjab Rural Support Program or? Uh, there are five of them, the, the national. Yes, all of the, so we, uh, we finance them, right? We finance, we've been financing a lot of their work. So, so their microfinance had, uh, I think they were supported. They started out with getting uh, uh, money from PPF uh, through our various, uh, you know, projects and programs. Um, and then as they moved along, like for example, NRSB then went and, and launched its own bank, right? So now you have NRSB bank, which is looking after the microfinance and has, has uh, separated out. So similarly, we have the, 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 the PMIC, which we have spun off as a separate arm uh, for us. In terms of uh, assessments and evaluations, um, we have had some assessments. We had two EFAT funded projects which are focused on microfinance, right? Over the period 2007 to maybe 2015 or, or 14. And uh, a lot of the evaluations kind of had some uh, uh, good sort of impacts coming out, but we, uh, you know, there was some increase in incomes of households, but there wasn't anything which really um, stood out. Uh, and there were certain, I would say, uh, maybe, you know, it wasn't the bullet, the silver bullet that they were expecting it to be in terms of getting households out of poverty. So it wasn't really having an impact on the target audience that they wanted to have an impact on. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are right now a number of agencies, I mean, at least four or five that I know of, I mean, um, NRSP, PRSP, and then yourself and uh, um, BISP. There's so many agencies working on poverty and the World Bank has this mission for ending poverty. Um, I mean, uh, does anybody calculate the overhead of this work? I mean, is there a huge amount of overhead for the delivery? And at the same time, um, you mentioned Ghazala Mansuri and you're absolutely right, but it's very interesting that when poverty decreased, the World Bank raised the line. 
So in a sense, it seems that the poverty is a is a moving target or is it a fixed target? I mean, in a sense. Well, I mean, you know, if you look at the World Bank, so initially it was the whole, you know, their definition of poverty is very much income based, right? Mm -hmm. and, and our definition with PPF, when we look at poverty, we look at it, you know, maybe we take on board the Amartya Sen kind of mm -hmm. uh, 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 version of poverty where it is about having the op opportunity, right? It's the lack of opportunity and the lack of options. And that comes from a number of things. It comes from no edu proper education system, you know, access to poor access to healthcare, and all of those those things that that uh, uh, deepen uh, the the sort of the, uh, the 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 sort of the poverty of a household of a household. So yes, I, I I think the World Bank changed from income poverty to cost of basic needs approach, right? So they used they initially it was caloric consumption that they looked at. What is the level of poverty? How do you define it based on caloric consumption? And they moved over to cost of basic needs assessment, and that uh, increased your your poverty levels a bit. But on the whole, the World Bank does keep saying that poverty has been reducing significantly over the years. And so, if you look at the last 20, 30 years, you see that there is this huge dip in poverty. And they, I mean, in the last few years, it's like it had gone down to 10%, I think, and then now it's gone back up to maybe 20% or 21%. Um, you know, we are all doing a lot on poverty, and I'll be very honest. PPF is an apex organization. We fund a lot of the RSPs and other uh, uh, civil society organizations working on, on uh, uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, but we still have only, uh, you know, we have, there are, say, six and a half thousand union councils in Pakistan. Uh, you know, we are in maybe a thousand or 50, maximum 1500 union councils. So, However much we're trying to do, we're still only managing to, to reach out to 20% of the country, right? Um, I feel it is government's responsibility at the end of the day. Government is, is the only machinery that really can has access to, to really support the entire population. Uh, and the reason that government is looking to PPF and looking to some of these other agencies as, as a way to support them is because when we do get funds from them, we uh, uh, the work that we are doing is kind of supporting the government's efforts, their poverty alleviation strategy, their their efforts towards you know social protection is being supported by us trying to graduate households out of poverty. Um, but then you also look at uh, you look at population growth, right? And you look at the impact of population growth on any kind of um, poverty alleviation uh, kind of uh, uh, programs. Um, it's, it's very tough. It's very tough to even just keep, uh, uh, you know, to manage to, to, to keep the same pace with population growth. So there are lots of macroeconomic uh, uh, areas that, that need to be also looked at when we have, a, you know, when we are looking at poverty alleviation, how does, what kind of strategy do we need? We need to look at inflation. We need to look at rural versus urban inflation. We need to look at migration. You know, the cities are just overflowing, and and I mean, there, there's there's huge opportunity cost of that for for this you know country. So I mean, it's a very long discussion. But, uh, there's another uh, there's another interesting. Um, you obviously all discussions are long, and they should be. Um, there's another interesting question that comes to mind uh, that the, the analysis that we've done. And, uh, many others have done, for example, the value in Lahore has shown and RFS and etc. that Pakistan is now largely an urban country. In fact, estimates suggest using satellite data, Pakistan may be as much as 70%, 80% urbanized. And the rural areas are dwindling and uh, dwindling very rapidly. But yet there's a huge amount of focus on rural poverty. Um, in the urban areas, there's also poverty. And one in initiative that we've taken, which is kind of hopefully attracted Sunny Initiative's attention and may receive attention, um, I hope so, uh, is the urban poverty, especially as it comes to street vending. Now, you guys are giving uh, assets to the rural people to do business. Now, street vending, the courts have declared street vending to be illegal, and they're throwing these people out. Uh, they're regarded as encroachers. So basically, the courts have thrown a few hundred thousand people into poverty in Karachi and Islamabad and other places. Um, yet, we can't seem to get a... a, a street vending framework going in the government. We are talking about it long time. We've been talking about it for 20 years now. Uh, is that something that PPF or, or, or you people would be interested? Because this is a homegrown initiative. It doesn't come out of Cambridge or Harvard or something. So what about the homegrown initiatives and things like this? 
I think homegrown initiatives are probably the best, right? Mm -hmm. It's the initiative that comes. I mean, this paradigm shift in development, it is coming from a younger generation who believes that they want to do enterprise, they want to work, they want to make a profit, but they want to help. They want to help others. Uh, and I think that is a different mindset to what we in the development sector have, have been doing for the last 20 years, which is donor money coming in. And then, you you know, it's sort of like supply driven kind of, you know, poverty alleviation. So we need to take on board like these kinds of startups and social enterprises and opportunities, uh, as you are saying, um, that, that can build a new kind of base, right? A new kind of economic base in this country. Um, and I, I, I do think with you that, that there is a serious, um, I think there is a serious intellectual crisis here in the sense that we don't, we look outside sometimes and we look around, but we're not really seeing what it is that can really benefit our own people. We don't, uh, you know, it, it is a, it is a I, I think it's a structural, uh, the, the structural inequalities that exist, right? We don't really hear the voices of the poor. We don't want to. We're too busy looking up, and and I think that that shift needs to happen. So I I mean I I, I think Kazi Saab is here. Maybe he can he can tell you. But I would love to work on our poverty. Where is <laughs> I thought he was here. I'd seen him earlier on. I I tried to find him. I couldn't but find maybe him. He's, uh, uh, a few words <laughs> disappeared. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I think well, he might well, have left. We will uh, live that interview very soon. So okay. the, the very insightful discussion with Kazi Saab. Probably we will also include our upcoming magazine, or all those you know, okay. like from Kazi Saab. And probably we will be in a position to arrange a, a specific webinar on Kazi Saab's part in the near future. Jaru, Jaru, absolutely. Well, Ji, thank you very much. Samia, thank you. Thank you, Shudat Saab. Thank you, Imran, in absence, in absentia. I know academics are very busy. Um, well, uh, Samia, we are also the poor of Pakistan, unheard, the PID and the universities of Pakistan. Uh, nobody listens to them, nobody cares about what they do. But yet, uh, we've been talking about street vending and opportunities for the poor for a long time. But that's the way the landscape is structured. The donors have the money, we don't have the money to pay our salaries. But nevertheless, we'll continue to try and learn, continue to try and think. And the whole idea of this webinar is really to give students an, uh, an opportunity to learn and think. So I'm very glad that you came and you educated our students on what's happening. And I'm sure that many of them will make a research topic out of this. Maybe they'll do a thesis, maybe they'll do something. So if they come to you later or help, please help them do it because our, our, uh, our poverty work really is to try and get our students thinking and involved in some work and reduce our reliance on, on, on the donors, which they have created this huge paraphernalia of policy making that I don't know how we can challenge, but we'll try and do that. So this is the David and Goliath approach. David is losing badly at the moment, but doesn't matter. We'll get it right. Thank you very much, folks. Great pleasure. We'll do something again soon. Whole point is to collaborate and learn together and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye.